It's lovely to be here. Um, as Amanda said, my name is Catherine Trott and I'm at the International Centre for Radio Astronomy Research uh, at Curtin University. So ICRA has two nodes, Curtin and uh, UWA, and some of our biggest uh, scientific drivers for the existence of ICRA is to help to um, uh, construct and operate the SKA telescopes. Uh, so um, I also have a, a part-time secondment um, with the SKA Observatory as the SKA Low Chief Operations Scientist. So this talk's going to be a little bit about SKA update and then a little bit about my own personal science. So this image you can see here is one of my favourites. This is not the SKA. This is the Murchison Widefield Array, which is a, a low frequency telescope that's on the same site as um, where the SKA is currently being built and uses a lot of the same infrastructure. And we've been operating this telescope since 2013 to do a lot of the science that I'm going to talk about. Um, and it's a precursor or a pathfinder instrument for the SKA. There we go. Okay, so um, what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to give uh, an overview of what the SKA Observatory is and its two telescopes. Uh, a little bit of an update on construction, where we are at the moment, and what our expectations are for, for early science and for full science operations. I'm then going to talk about ionisation um, in the universe, and I'm not going to talk about it on the galactic scale. I'm going to talk about it on the cosmic scale, and this is the sort of science that I'm interested in and one of the major science goals for the SKA um, telescopes. If I have time, and I probably won't because I tend to talk a bit too much, I'll talk a little bit about some of the other traces um, at high redshift that's going to provide complementary information to the radio. Okay, so let's get into it. So what is the SKA Observatory? Um, if you don't know, it's one observatory, two telescopes and three sites. This is kind of the, the byline for SKA. But really what this is, is the world's largest radio telescope with an expected lifetime of about 50 years. So the two telescopes are based in Western Australia, a low frequency radio telescope array, and in South Africa, a mid frequency array. Uh, and the headquarters is, is here, as you can see in this image, in Jodrell Bank in the United Kingdom. So it's a, an intergovernmental organisation, a little bit like um, CERN is, I think. Uh, and so it's uh, funded and um, o overseen, its governance is by, by a range of, uh, of governments, national governments around the world. And Australia has about a 14% share in that as one of the host countries for the telescopes. Um, the total project cost is going to be about 2 billion euros, um, but that's a very round number because of the, 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 um, the, the cost of infrastructure, etc. And really excitingly, um, we're expecting first science verification data in about three years time um, with full operations by the end of this decade. And we're on track for that at the moment. Now, this is actually just SKA phase one that we're talking about at, at, at the moment. This is already going to be um, a game changer from the point of view of, of radio astronomy and will be the most capable and largest radio telescope in the world. But the, the future ambition is for SKA phase two, which will be 10 times larger. And um, we don't call it the square kilometre array anymore because it isn't a square kilometre of collecting area. That's our ambition for phase two. So that's why it's just SKA um, now. So here are the two telescopes. Um, the, Image on the left is a, a real image um, out on, on the telescope site of what the low frequency array uh, is, is looking like in the Murchison region of Western Australia. And on the right hand side is um, a, an artist's depiction of uh, SKA NID, which you can see has two different types of dishes. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about why that is um, in a moment. But you can see that these two radio telescopes look very different. They use very different um, a very different instrumentation in order to be able to detect these radio waves. And that's really just based on the efficiency of detecting radio waves that are anywhere from less than a centimetre to multiple metres in wavelength. And so you use tech, different technology for that, um, but, but these actually do meet in the middle at 350 megahertz. So it's going to be the most sensitive, highest resolution, largest redshift range uh, radio telescope. So let's just uh, remind ourselves why we want to do radio astronomy, because I know this is a bit of a broad audience. So astronomy operates over um, the whole electromagnetic spectrum and also into multi-messenger, um, as you're very aware, being here at Monash. Um, but why do we do radio astronomy? So at radio frequencies, there's two types of objects that we tend to see. 
Firstly, we see electrons spiraling around magnetic fields. So anywhere where you have large scale magnetic fields in the universe, like, um, like galaxies, AGN, star forming galaxies, things like this, uh, we see synchrotron radiation. So that's the broadband continuum radiation that we see to study the universe. Um, and, uh, and, and we also see it in really extreme objects. So things like neutron stars and pulsars. And again, that's where you have those really strong magnetic fields. So extreme objects and massive galaxies that are very active with black holes. And also in um, particular transitions um, in the radio spectrum that are important for the universe. And the ones I'm going to talk about primarily are hydrogen and helium as the two uh, most abundant primordial elements in the universe. Both the hydrogen and the helium hyperfine transitions are in the radio regime. And so we can map the history of the universe in the radio uh, by looking at these particular uh, emission lines um, for hydrogen and helium. Okay, so I'm going to take you through a few slides um, that are very high level, and these are not meant to insult your intelligence. These are, um, th these are slides that I actually presented to the Department of Industry, who are the, the, the government department who is actually funding the SKA project here in Australia, to try and inspire them about what the, what the scientific outcomes and what the vision is for the SKA. So I'm going to present them to you, but um, we'll go through them quite quickly. So as I mentioned, the, uh, the story of the universe is very much the story of hydrogen. Hydrogen is created in the Big Bang. We see it all the way to our own galaxy today. And it really tells the story of the evolution of the cosmic structure, the astrophysics of the universe over very long um, timescales. So the SKA is very much being built to observe neutral hydrogen from its hyperfine transition, which has a rest frequency of um, 1.4 gigahertz. When we uh, place it out in the universe due to cosmological expansion, that's redshifted anywhere from about, I've written 100 there, but really 50 megahertz up to 1420 when we're talking about local hydrogen within our own galaxy. And so the frequency ranges of the two telescopes here, 50 to 350 megahertz and 350 megahertz to 15 gigahertz are really well matched to uh, studying this transition throughout the universe. And in the early universe, the hydrogen gas in its neutral form fills the void between galaxies. Uh, so it, it fills the, the intergalactic medium and it fills space. And the properties of the hydrogen signal tell us about those very first generations of, of stars and galaxies. After uh, there's enough photons in the universe to reionize that hydrogen, in other words, to have the proton and the uh, electron ripped apart from each other, and that happens at about a billion years after the Big Bang, then we move into the phase of hydrogen being locked as cold gas in galaxies. And so it's part of the fuel of star formation. So we can trace it over cosmic time to trace all of these different aspects of, um, of the story of the universe. Uh, so I've already talked, this is what I'm gonna talk mostly about in the second half of the talk, which is the dawn of, dawn of light, which is using hydrogen gas to tell us about these very first stars and, and galaxies. But what else does the SKA want to do? Well, it's going to do cosmology. Uh, and it's actually going to use hydrogen because we can place it at a distance in the universe due to its frequency from the cosmological redshift. We're going to use the location of all of the hydrogen gas to map where the galaxies are at a very high redshift. And so this is where we can do the cosmology. We can do our shape of the universe. We can do things like weak lensing surveys where we're looking at how the light is bent by large scale structure um, in the sky. So that's something that will be done by both telescopes, but mostly by SKA mid. Um, coming much more local to us, um, SKA is going to study our galaxy in great detail. So again, this is where hydrogen plays an important role. So the hydrogen cycle, molecular hydrogen, um, the creation of stars, that baryon cycle that we see in galaxies, um, and SKA will get a very high resolution look at that as something that's very close to us. Uh, it's also going to be about the story of gravity, and there are a lot of people in this room I wouldn't have to talk much, uh, um, tell much about this, but by timing pulsars and looking at where pulsars are in the sky, we can understand uh, the, the properties of the gravitational waves, and SKA is going to be more sensitive and be able to look at more places in the sky and time them with higher precision than we've been able to do before with any telescope. And so this is going to be able to place even more stringent limits on what we understand about gravity. And something that... that there's been a promise of for many years, but telescopes haven't been able to really have the sensitivity to do that is to actually map the magnetic fields in the universe, the very largest scale magnetic fields. 
And you can do this through rotation measure, measure synthesis, where we're actually looking at the rotation of a wave front through a magnetic field. And by mapping this with very high precision across the sky, I hope to get a, a map of what that, what that magnetic field looks like um, uh, compared to the cosmic web of galaxies that are in the background of it. So coming again really cl much closer to home, um, the story of life in our own galaxy and really very close to us. Um, so again, this is something that's very well known here. So looking at uh, particular organic molecules, the birth of planetary systems, these protoplanetary disks that we're going to be able to see at those higher frequencies. So really probing different areas to try and understand um, what we can understand more about um, the potential for life uh, in, around other stars in our own galaxy. And I already pointed to the fact that radio astronomy allows you to look at really extreme events in the universe. So pulsars or rotating neutron stars are one example of that, but there's also magnetars, which are a bit like a pulsar, but with a much stronger magnetic field. Um, merging binaries that we'll see with some multi-messenger follow-up or multi-messenger um, prompts uh, to begin with, and also fast radio bursts, which are these really um, unusual, extremely bright, short-lived uh, radio uh, signals that we see from cosmological distance in the universe, and we still don't have a really good understanding of what they are. So explosions merge as black holes um, through a lot of cosmic time. We'll also be able to map uh, some of the properties of our own uh, our own star, the Sun, in great detail by understanding that the, a lot of the heliospheric um, uh, activity that we see across uh, time and across frequency from the Sun. So these are uh, the, the flares that we see. We're going to see them um, uh, for, as they were eight minutes ago, but this gives a lot of predictive power for what we might expect to see in the ionosphere and what sort of space weather we might uh, see from, from the Sun from this activity. And, and it's with any large telescope that you build and anything that's bigger and newer and has more flexibility and capability, there's always the potential for something that you haven't expected. And this is probably one of the most exciting science cases for the SKA is the story of the undiscovered. So fast radio bursts and pulsars uh, hadn't been observed before. That's not what was um, being looked at when people have found them in data. But again, it was having that capability and that increased sensitivity or time resolution of the data that, that meant that these were um, discovered and, uh, and, and now very rich uh, fields of research. So the SKA is really the story of the universe through radio eyes. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about SKA Lower, give a quick update on how construction um, is going and where we are. So it is um, being built in Inyarimana Ilguri Bundura, CSIRO's Murchison Radio Astronomy Observatory, and that is now the official name for the observatory site. It's a, a Wadjuri name, so the Wadjuri Yamaji are the traditional custodians of the observatory um, land, and SKA works very closely with the Wadjuri to ensure that everything that gets put on the ground and everything that gets done is, is done in a culturally appropriate way. And it means sharing the sky and stars, which is a really nice story for how the SKA wants to interact with the Wadjuri people um, and make sure that the science is beneficial for everybody. So on the right hand side here, um, for a bit of scale, you can see uh, a couple of our SKA um, employees putting together one of these single dipole antennas, of which there'll be 131,000 of them in SKA low. Um, and each of them is just a little bit like a TV antenna. It's a dual polarization piece of, um, uh, of metal. And the, the structure of it is such that uh, at the top where we have the very small uh, dipoles, we're receiving the highest frequency. So that's where we get the 350 megahertz. And all the way at the bottom where we're looking at four, six meter wavelengths, um, that's the, the 50 megahertz end of it. And so we can receive that full 50 to 350 megahertz with an antenna such as this. Now, as I mentioned, it's not the only telescope that's on site. In fact, there's a number of telescopes that are on in Yarimani Ilguri Bundura. One is the ASCAP telescope, which is a little bit more like SKA mid and operates at higher frequencies. There's the Murchison Widefield Array that you saw right at the start of the talk. And here for scale is uh, Nicole Barry, who's one of our research fellows, just showing you how big it is. So it's a very different design. It's made of these little dipoles that are about this high. They sort of look like spiders and it's much more compact than the SKA, but it's, um, it's trying to do a lot, of, a lot of the same science. One of the, uh, 
One of the features of observing at long wavelengths is that you naturally get a very large field of view. So the field of view of your telescope goes as the wavelength divided by uh, the diameter. This one has a diameter of 4.4 metres. And so it sees about 30 degrees of the sky at any one time, which is a huge swathe of the sky. SKA will be about 40 metre diameter and so it has a field of view of about 5 degrees which is still substantially larger than what you get at optical wavelengths and with a lot of other telescopes and so when you're trying to match up science this is a consideration. Okay so I'll just do a few slides on uh, radio astronomy instrumentation just to make sure that we're, we're all sort of on the same page of what we're looking at here and I appreciate there's quite a range of backgrounds in the audience here. Um, so a lot of uh, the radio astronomy that's been done um, probably 50 to uh, say 20 or 30 years ago are with single dish telescopes. So they tend to operate at higher frequencies. They're often looking at more new, um, local hydrogen gas around 1.4 gigahertz, but typically operating above 500 megahertz. So the Green Bank Telescope on the left and the Parkes Radio Telescope here in Australia on the right hand side. And if you don't have a particular um, type of increased feed like the multi-beam that Parkes um, has or had, uh, you get just a, a single measurement on the sky. So it's a single pixel, which is what Green Bank has. So if you, you get all this collecting area, but you just see one pixel on the sky. So if you want to make an image, you sort of have to raster scan across the sky and put together your image um, from that. So instead, you'd like to be able to make an image directly from your telescope. And so one way you can do that is with, with a radio interferometer where effectively what an interferometer is, is it's like having one massive, massive dish, but with a huge number of holes in them, holes in it, and then interfering the different patterns together to be able to produce that different information on the sky. So on the left is the AT compact array here in Australia, which is just six dishes, and on the right is the very large array. And both SKA low and SKA mid are going to be interferometers. They're going to use this interferometry um, technique to be able to image the sky as well as do it the other science that doesn't require imaging. So how does this work? Just as a, as a reminder, it's not like optical interferometry where we're superposing waves. Here we're multiplying waves together, or multiplying voltages, but effectively you're multiplying electric fields together. So on the left is our single dish. Everything hits the dish, goes up, and you get one number at any point of time. With an interferometer with uh, n dishes, we can get this number of measurements. And that's because this is the number of combinations of baselines that you get from the telescope. And it all relies on the fact that as a wave comes in, there's an extra path length between one dish and the next. And that path length depends on the angle of the source on the sky and the distance between the telescopes on the ground, so that baseline. And so you can use that information to reconstruct the sky because it tells you something about where things come from. So this is a bit of an ugly slide and I apologise for it, but this is just um, demonstrating how multiplying these electric fields together, which is what we have here, this is the phase difference between the arrays from sun dish one and sun dish two. Um, and you can write that as um, this, this um, extra path length di difference here. And so that goes as the, uh, the, the angle on the sky, uh, the wavelength of the, um, of the light and the distance between uh, the two telescopes. And so you can see that this is a Fourier kernel. And so what a radio telescope measures or an interferometer measures is effectively a Fourier transform of the sky, but with a lot of the Fourier plane missing. So you don't have that complete information. So what does that look like when you actually try and image with a real array? And so here's just some examples showing you um, on the top left here in each of them, it shows you which parts of the Fourier plane uh, are being sampled. You can see this one's got, gonna have a lot of sampling. This one's gonna have very poor sampling. And when we put our galaxy through it, this is what our image looks like. Very poor, very poor, slightly better, starting to look like a galaxy and better again. And that's because of the completeness of that Fourier information when you're trying to reconstruct the sky. So SKA is designed to have a lot of Fourier components being measured at once so that at all times when we observe, we can make an image of the sky. Now, low frequency, like I said, we don't use dishes. We use um, what are called aperture arrays. 
but they effectively work in the same way. So if you think about our dish and it all uh, reflects its light up to um, some antenna that's in the top of the feed here, it's like taking that and just placing it on the ground. And so each of these is, uh, the signals from each of these is added together. And if you add it together, add them together with particular delays between them, then you can point electronically on the sky. And this is a much more efficient way of collecting photons that have one, two, three, four meter wavelengths than, than a dish, which you'd have to build a really, really huge one. And you just can't do that for mechanical reasons. So when we go to low frequencies, we work with these aperture arrays. The nice thing about these is there are no moving parts. They're all steered electronically just by putting those delays into the system. The problem with these is that they see the sky in a really ugly way. Uh, and I might uh, talk a little bit more about that. But this is what SKA low type technology will be. And that's, this is a, the MWA. So here's a nice image of the first prototype station for the SKA. You can see there's 256 of these dipoles in an area that has a diameter of about 38 metres. Uh, and you can see here, this is a ground plane that sits underneath it, which effectively means that you don't have any signal from the ground coming through. Uh, and um, I'll, let that, I'll let that run through a little bit more, but you can see that this prototype station is actually um, located quite close to the Murchison Widefield Array because it used a lot of the signal processing infrastructure um, to, to connect it all up and ensure it was working. And this is one of the first stages of prototyping for the telescope. You can just see it at the end there. That's the MWA on the bottom left. Okay, so where are we at? Um, again, these images I've put in here for scale so you can see how tall these antennas are. They're really big. They're about this high. And when you have a, a field of them or a sea of them in the center of the array, they're really quite imposing. Um, but they do just sit on the ground. They're clipped into the ground plane. Uh, and so they, they, they're not... Um, they don't disturb the ground um, a great deal, but they need to be that tall because we want that very wide frequency range to be able to um, uh, look for the hydrogen signal. So here's just a, a shot of um, one of the original prototype arrays. This is the second prototype array it was in May and June, and this is all now connected up and they're about to start doing um, test observations with this just to test the full end-to-end -end signal chain. So on the bottom right here is an artist's impression of what that central, a central area of SKA low will look like. The idea of this is that the stations are close enough together that it's a bit like a sea of elements rather than individual stations. So when you have a, a dish-based array, unless you can move the dishes around, um, you're really fixed in what your telescope looks like. Whereas with an array like this, where each dipole is individually connected up as its own signal, you can decide how you want to define your telescope. And it's this flexibility that really will be the thing that is really new and unique about SKA Low in particular, that's going to allow it to do the wide range of, of science cases that it's hoping to prosecute. So for example, you can take just a, a chunk of a station and make that your station. So it has a larger field of view, or you can add lots of stations together for more sensitivity in a smaller field of view. Um, and all of that flexibility is built into the system, depending on your science, how you want to shape uh, the telescope. Um, SKA NID um, is under construction. A lot of it's already done because it's going to incorporate an existing radio telescope called Meerkat that uses slightly different technology, but not radically different. So Meerkat is operating at the moment in mid frequencies and uh, construction is, um, is happening on SKA NID in step with SKA Low. Uh, so in terms of dates, most of this slide is probably not really of relevance, except to say that AA2, which is one of these aperture, um, sorry, array releases, uh, which is 64 dishes for SKA mid and 64 stations for SKA low, um, is expected around 2026, 2027. And the, 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 um, the project is on track to achieve that. And the reason that, that's, that this is an interesting milestone is that this is the first time that the science community will get verification data. So this is sort of shared risk science data with which they can um, try and do small science projects. But also at low frequencies, this will now be the most capable radio telescope that we have on Earth. So we don't need to get all the way through to 2029 when the whole thing turns on to have the most capable, highest resolution, most sensitive radio telescope um, that exists. We get that 
uh, in about two or three years time. Well, sorry, three or four years time. Uh, so just a couple of, of images of um, the, a ceremony that was held in December last year to mark the start of construction um, and also um, the really important Indigenous land use agreement. So SKA doesn't want to go down the road of some of the other international radio telescopes that have had contention with um, native title holders on their land. It's really important that SKA does this right, both in South Africa and here in Australia. And so this agreement um, is very extensive and, and lays out how the SKA will operate and what it will deliver for the Wadjuri people. Okay, so now we're gonna change, change tracks from, from that and talk a little bit about um, the science. And so I've already hinted a lot about the ionization of hydrogen in the universe. And I'm also gonna talk about helium um, as well. So what is the science that we care about? What are we actually trying to do here? This is a, a simulation of a box of the universe. And what you're seeing here is the brightness temperature. So the temperature we observe with our radio telescope of neutral hydrogen gas in the first billion years of the universe. Um, so what you can see is that um, the temperature changes, which is the color bar on the right hand side here, and over time it gets eaten away. So it gets a bit of a Swiss cheese look and then it completely disappears. Uh, and so all of that spatial information, also the amplitude information over time is encoding astrophysics about the early universe. And that's what we actually care about when we're trying to map this signal. But a lot of the work of SKA and its precursors is trying to map this hydrogen signal so that we can understand the nature of the first stars and galaxies in the universe. So that's what I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to talk about it from an observer's point of view. Okay, so let's, um, let's just start really, really, really simple. Um, because I want to introduce, I want to try and motivate why looking at helium is also interesting. Um, so Big Bang nuclear synthesis, um, I'm not an expert in this at all, and other people in the audience are. <laughs> um, but if we look at, uh, here we have uh, the density of ordinary matter relative to photons, in other words, this is time. Uh, and here's our element abundance relative to hydrogen um, in the universe. So in, the, in, in Big Bang, we get hydrogen, helium, and a tiny amount of lithium. I'm going to ignore the lithium for now because that's really tiny. Um, and we're going to talk about hydrogen in helium. So how do we go about observing these? Well, in the radio regime uh, at low frequencies, the best observable is a hyperfine transition. And you get a hyperfine transition when you have a coupling of the, the spin of the electron with a nuclear magnetic moment. So hydrogen has a non-zero magnetic moment because it's just one proton, so that's great. Um, helium-3 also has a non-zero magnetic moment because it's missing one of its neutrons, and so it has a hyperfine transition. But helium-4, which amounts to about 25% um, of the abundance of the universe um, after the Big Bang, has a zero magnetic moment. So it has no hyperfine transition. So if we want to observe in the radio hydrogen and helium and how they evolve over cosmic time, we need to work with helium-3. And the thing that's a bit of a pain about helium-3 is it's only one part in 10 to the 5 compared to hydrogen. So it's a very, very weak signal. But there are some other things that make it um, more observable and therefore will, um, useful to pursue. So this is a bit of a, a busy slide, but uh, what I'm trying to demonstrate here over cosmic time, so this is obviously not a linear, a linear plot, but we have the, the Big Bang on the left-hand side. We have us here 13.8 uh, billion years later. And um, in the very early universe, we know at about a redshift of 1100, that's the surface of last scattering. That's when the, the hydrogen, the proton and the electron from hydrogen combine together and you get the free streaming of the photons that now become the cosmic microwave background. Um, that happens at about 400,000 years after the Big Bang. But prior to that, uh, doubly ionized helium and then singly, singly ionized helium recombine at redshifts of about 5,000 and 3,000. And this is a lot more uncertain because their photons just get caught up in the rest of the CMB light. Um, and so these are sort of theoretical expectations and very round numbers. But they, because they're higher uh, ionization energy, they recombine earlier. 
When we move uh, forward in time, we have the cosmic dark ages. This is where we just have dark matter scaffolding. We have the cosmic microwave background photons that are free streaming. But at this point, we don't have stars, galaxies, those first black holes producing other light in the universe, which is why it's called the dark ages. Um, but at some point, about one to 200 million years after the Big Bang, we get those very first stars turning on, forming proto um, galaxies, um, dying and forming uh, X-ray binaries and, 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 and um, stellar mass black holes that are producing higher energy light. And at that point, we start to have the reionization of the hydrogen. So this is the light that uh, has um, uh, enough energy. Um, so UV light that has enough energy to rip the hydrogen gas back apart again, and it remains reionized for the rest of the universe. Helium, uh, helium goes from neutral to singly ionized um, with an energy of 24.6 electron volts compared to hydrogen's 13.6 electron volts. But we expect, given the stellar population at that time, that the helium, that the first helium reionization happens at a similar time to hydrogen reionization. However, uh, singly to doubly ionized helium reionization happens much later. Well, much later being about a billion years. So redshift three or so is about two billion years after the, after the Big Bang. And this is because this has a, an ionization potential of 54.4 electron volts. And to have enough photons of that energy to reionize hydrogen completely um, requires a large space density of, of supermassive black holes. So active galactic nuclei, some other very energetic sources in the universe that can produce enough photons. So you can see in this picture that we have the recombination of our three um, species. Oh, well, helium is obviously two species, but it goes through two recombinations. And then the reionization of all three of them together. And by mapping them both over cosmic time, it tells us about the radiation state of the universe and also the, the sort of the composition of the universe in terms of the, the number of different types of objects that we might have. So this is something that we want to do with SKA. So I've already sort of talked about this, so I won't go into a lot of detail. Hydrogen's ionization energy, as we all know, is 13.6 electron volts. Helium's is, uh, uh, is, is higher. And I've already mentioned the fact that hydrogen has a hypervine transition that has a rest frequency of 1.4 gigahertz. The uh, helium-3 hypervine transition has a rest frequency of about 8.7 gigahertz. So now much higher frequency. So if we're looking at about redshift four for that to be reionized, then it, um, we expect it to see it around 1500 to 2000 megahertz. Okay, so now we're operating in that higher frequency, the, the band that SKA mid is gonna be actually able to look at. So this is just another schematic of what we might expect the hydrogen signal to look like over time based on a, a model for the background radiation of the universe. The overall temperature, which is what this bottom plot shows here, this is our cosmic time. So this is the, 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 um, the red shifted frequency, but you can just see this as time. The overall temperature of the gas in the universe goes through some interesting um, absorption and emission features that are related to when the first stars formed, how hot the gas is from a kinetic energy point of view, and how much signal there is left, because once the neutral hydrogen has been reionized, we no longer get that hyperfine transition because there's no coupling to the electron spin anymore. That's gone because there's no electron. This is what we might expect to see if we took a slice of the universe and looked spatially at what the hydrogen gas looked like. Again, it goes through absorption regions, gets heated, and then actually it has a lot of these interesting structures, these bubbles, um, within which sit those first stars and galaxies producing that UV light and eating away the neutral hydrogen. So we'd like to map this for hydrogen and for helium. Um, so just putting, uh, trying to connect up the observable that we look at as our, the radio observers, which is this differential brightness temperature relative to the cosmic, back, cosmic microwave backgrounds, like our background light source. We're looking at the temperature of the gas relative to that. It has components that have to do with the cosmology. So this is the, the density in the universe. There's redshift. This is about the, the Hubble flow and the proper motion of, of the, um, the gas relative to, to the, um, relative to the photons. So this is all about sort of the shape and cosmology of the universe. 
And then this, this uh, here is called the spin temperature, which is just the, the occupancy of the upper and lower hyperfine states. But it's set by all of these different terms here. And this is where the astrophysics comes in. This is set by the background CMB temperature. It's set by what's called the color temperature, which is our radiation field. Um, once we have lime and alpha photons coming in and pumping our hydrogen so that the electron goes to higher energy states and then drops back down again, its spin flips around. And so that's why there's a coupling of the radiation to what this spin temperature actually looks like. And then this is the coupling to the kinetic temperature of the gas that obviously is going to move the line in and out of residence. And that's why there's a coupling there. So what I'm trying to show here is that by studying this distribution of the temperature of hydrogen gas through the universe, we can try and unlock all of this astrophysics and cosmology, which is actually telling us what we care about, which is what is the radiation state of the universe at that point around that gas? How hot is the gas? How is it being heated? So helium-2, in a very similar way, um, has a differential brightness temperature. Uh, the hydrogen brightness temperature was about 20 millikelvin. Um, I didn't point that out, but of order 20 millikelvin. You can see this one is a factor of a thousand smaller, 18 microkelvin. And this is to do with a lot of factors, one of which being that helium-3 has only one part in 10 to the 5 in the early universe. But you win a little bit back because there are some components of this equation, like the spontaneous emission rate, that's much higher for helium than for hydrogen. The other thing about observing this is because it's observed at higher frequencies, so that 1500 megahertz to 2000 megahertz, at that point, the universe, sorry, the, the sky that we see with our radio telescopes is much cooler and much less structured, which means the observing becomes a lot easier than at low frequencies. So we win in that way, but the signal is very small. And when you put all these bits and pieces together, this, the, the experiment's about the same level of difficulty. So I showed this before, um, but I won't show it again. It's just, this is um, just what, what, what motivated us before. And this is what we might expect to see if we look at a very particular frequency in the universe and we could actually map what that hydrogen looks like. No radio telescope that we have at the moment has the sensitivity, the capability to image, directly image the hydrogen gas. So that's something that we want to do with SKA. So SKA has three types of experiments to try and probe the hydrogen era, but helium will be sort of similar as well. I'll say that this is a, this is a major research push is, is looking for hydrogen in the early universe. Helium, most people aren't even thinking about at the moment. That's just something that we're sort of personally interested in. So there's a power spectrum measurement, which is just looking at the amount of power in that temperature on different scales in the universe. There's the direct imaging that I just talked about. And then there's also some line of sight studies where effectively you're looking at a background bright source like an AGN, and you're looking at hydrogen that happens to be along the line of sight and absor is absorbing some of that light. Um, so that, that's a slightly different type of experiment. But the two main experiments are the power spectrum and imaging. So why do we want to use a power spectrum? Um, this is what it actually looks like when we're talking about when we're making a power spectrum. So if you can imagine your, uh, your universe as a function of, uh, of uh, depth into the universe, um, and this is your angular modes on the sky, you take a three-dimensional Fourier transform and you square. And that's basically what a power spectrum is. And so therefore it's telling you about the amount of um, signal on different spatial scales. And this is a model for what we expect. So big spatial scales, which is the, the bottom left here, you expect a lot of structure and you expect um, a lot less signal on the small spatial scales. Now we use a power spectrum because firstly, it adds together a lot of information and therefore it increases your sensitivity to a very weak signal. Um, but secondly, it's because if we look at the expected distribution of temperatures, uh, at a lot of um, redshifts in the universe, it's highly Gaussian. So if we can uh, measure the width of this Gaussian, which is what the power spectrum is, it's a variance measure, then we're capturing a lot of the information that will allow us to extract the astrophysics. So it's a, a, um, it's a, a useful uh, statistic to use. 
Now, this is a difficult experiment uh, for a number of reasons, um, one of which is that the rest of the sky is very structured and very bright compared to the signal we're looking for. The signal we're looking for is about 30 millikelvin in the hydrogen, um, but the, these sources in the sky are something like 1,000, 10,000 um, Kelvin. So the, the dynamic range required for this, this uh, experiment is very, very high. And this is one of the reasons why we're still pursuing this, this signal. I'll jump through that and just talk about um, current measurements. So um, this is where the field sits at the moment um, across the different telescopes that are trying to do this experiment. So there are three major telescopes around the world that are looking for this uh, high redshift early universe hydrogen signal, one of which is the Murchison Widefield Array here in Australia, one's in South Africa and one is in the Netherlands. And on the bottom here um, in, the, uh, in the black are some different models for what we might expect um, that power to look like as a function of redshift. And these are all the measurements that we have here. And you can see that we're, we're still a couple of orders of magnitude above where we think we're going to need to be. And it's because of that, all of those other systematics that I just briefly mentioned there, everything else in the sky and the complexity of our instrument that makes this difficult. Okay, so I'll talk briefly about reionization, um, helium reionization as well. And the reason I did this is that I think this paper should be on archive today. Um, so helium reionization, as I said, is in some ways a lot easier and in other ways a lot more difficult because it's a really small, small signal. Um, and, and there have been a few papers that have talked about trying to do this, um, trying to do this experiment and actually map the end of helium reionization. So we tried to actually do this and we used archival data from the Australia Telescope Compact Array. So that's that six dish array in Narrabri in New South Wales. And we used one particular patch of the sky that has a lot of observations in it. And that's um, this source B1934-638, which is just a really boring power law AGN. But the reason it's been looked at so much is it's a calibrator source for the telescope. So before every observation someone does, they go and stare at this thing for half an hour to calibrate their data, and then they go and do their science. So it means that there are thousands of hours of this um, source being observed in the data. So you can just go into the archive and pull it all out. So in the end, we used about 200 hours that we that was clean of radio frequency interference. Uh, and our best limit's about 490 microkelvin, which is not 18 microkelvin, as you can see. This is not a detection. Um, but what we were able to do with this is we demonstrated how you would actually do this experiment and, and where where the issues lie with doing this experiment. And radio frequency interference is going to be one of them. Okay, so I don't think I have time to talk about line intensity mapping, so I'm just going to have one slide on it, um, and then I'll come to my conclusions. So um, at high redshift, we have things like J um, the James Webb Space Telescope. We've had the Hubble Space Telescope for, for um, a period of time, and we have some of the big ground-based 8 and 10 metre telescopes, things like the VLT. And those have a very small field of view. They're really good for looking at details of galaxies, um, very full, small structures, and you've seen all the beautiful images from the James Webb Space Telescope. But if we're trying to take that information and we're trying to combine it with what we see with our radio telescopes, where the scales are huge, we're talking about things that are arc minutes across, degrees across, tens of degrees across. James Webb is like an arc second across, you know, it's a tiny, tiny scale. You can't compare the science because the scales are just so different that you can't map what's happening at the small scale to what's happening at the, at the large scale. So this is where line intensity mapping, which has been around for a while, a lower redshift, um, really comes to the fore. And there are a lot of surveys um, and experiments that are going to be um, started and launched into space over the next five years. They're going to look at a lot of complementary traces of what's happening in the high redshift universe. Things like carbon monoxide and carbon-2, which are telling us about the star formation in the early universe and other, other transitions, Lyman alpha emission, oxygen-3, where we have um, very hot stars, these types of objects. And because um, what line intensity mapping does is that instead of trying to look at a single galaxy, it just collects all of the light from a, a patch of the sky, which is a little bit like what we do with the hydrogen and the helium. And these experiments are much better matched in terms of their overall field of view, but also their resolution. So we can now start doing cross-correlation or other studies of these different traces on top of the 21 centimetre, both from a, a prediction point of view to predict what we might expect to see, 
in the hydrogen gas, but also to try and combine that astrophysics um, together because we're no longer just trying to use one tracer to understand what's actually happening in these galaxies. So line intensity mapping is something that, that there's going to be a lot of activity in in the coming years. And I'll just show this to show some of the experiments that are, that are upcoming to look at different transitions. And SKA mid and SKA low really nicely match these in terms of the redshift, but also in terms of the resolution and field of view, which is what the vertical axis is here. So this is something that's going to really be exciting in the next few years to complement these radio observations. Okay, so I'll summarise. Um, so the SKA observatory is under construction now and promises to address many unanswered astrophysical questions and hopefully discover some, some new types of um, astrophysical sources. We're expecting in 2026 to have the first science verification data with a telescope that's larger than anything we have at the moment. Um, I didn't talk very much about MWA, but as a telescope that's trying to work in this space at the moment, um, we're learning a lot about how to do the experiment and what some of the, the systematic issues are that we need to deal with. And in future, having these um, links between uh, the radio and some of these other complementary traces is really going to strengthen what we can understand about that first one to two billion years of the universe. And I'll stop there. Thanks. So your yeah, Christmas trees look a bit different to the NWA little bugs. Yeah. So what's the, um, why the change if the NWA has been one? Um, so the MWA really drops off its sensitivity um, at the high 200s of megahertz. And one of, the, one of the key components for SKA is that we have a well-matched high sensitivity at 350 megahertz where SKA low tapers off and SKA mid picks up. And so in order to be able to do that, and it also in order to be able to go down to lower frequencies, so to go to the higher redshifts, redshift 20, 25, 50 megahertz, um, you can't do that with an MWA dipole. It just, it rolls off too quickly. So you really need to build something that has the capacity to have high sensitivity across the band. Is sort of any random shape will do, or is it like very well optimized? Uh, no, it's, it's very well optimized. Um, the, the issue with it that's a bigger issue than with MWA is because when you get big bits of metal and you stick them right next to each other, they interfere with each other. This is this mutual coupling. And, and that produces all sorts of interesting features in the way that it responds to the sky. And so that's the trade-off. You get the sensitivity that you want, all that collecting area and the performance, but, but the, the, the issue is that you get a lot more of these electromagnetic interactions between the, uh, the dipoles that, that can be problematic. In the discussions with the department, they say that they want to hear about ESO and SKA together. I know how much ESO is going to cost, but I actually don't know how much more SKA needs to get to, is it AA4? So how much more money does it need? Um, so yeah, they have current, they currently have funding for AA star, which is 307 you know, SKA low stations, the really random number, and AA, um, AA4, or the, the full operation is 512. How much more money do they need? I think it's about 10%. It's the, it's the amount that two or three more countries joining will provide. And because when countries join, they don't put in 14%, like Australia, they put in a much smaller amount. So I think it's of order 10%. Yeah. So I couldn't quite understand the link between SKA and Bow and Mid. So are they just two separate telescopes with the same name or is it like a genuine need to be on the same project? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, they are two independent telescopes that work to have similar sensitivities and are designed such that they have a, an overlap in their frequency range so that you can do your science continuously. So pulsars, for example, you want to observe all the way from low up to mid frequencies. Some of the other science cases you'll only do with one or, in, or the other. So because one's in South Africa and one's in Australia, they see the same sky, just rotated in time, but it's not like one's Northern Hemisphere and one's Southern Hemisphere. There will be joint observations where both telescopes are looking in particular with pulsars. Um, at the same sources at the same time to get that full contemporaneous data set. So originally it was all going to be on one site, but it was always going to be multiple telescopes because you, you 
there isn't technology that allows you to observe all the way from 50 megahertz to 15 gigahertz and have really nice sensitive you know sensitivity across the whole band you, do, you can't do that with one type of antenna Andrew? Um, yes it's very interesting because i've learned a lot about this telescope so you mentioned jocelyn bell and of course she used i think jodrell and they saw the uh, looked into the northern skies so this, this telescope is primarily the southern sky. Um, so what happens, I mean, are there, how far north can you reach? Can, what will happen? Can Jodrell Bank be used as some sort of calibrator or something? Yes, absolutely. No, it's a great question. Um, this can see to 50 degrees north in, decl in declination, but by then you really wouldn't want to be using it. It'll be, it'll be pretty ugly. Um, LOFAR is the telescope in the Northern Hemisphere. LOFAR, which is the low frequency array, which is based in the Netherlands. That is the one that's going to be the most complementary to SKA. And it will provide a lot of that overlap of sky area to ensure that they're, they're calibrating each other. There's sure consistency in the sky. But you're right, there's, there's parts of the Northern sky that SKA just can't see. So Miller Goss will miss out. Yes, Miller Goss will miss out. <laughs> yeah. Hey, sir. Um, you mentioned that the science verification phase will be in the next few years. So what kind of observations is that? So the plan is that the observatory will um, reach out to the, the, the current science working group. So we're sort of putting together the, the initial proposals for experiments um, and say, this, this is what the array will look like. Um, what sort of science do you propose to do? So with that array already, we can start to do the hydrogen observations from the early universe because it's already a more capable telescope than anything we have at the moment. So we'll be doing test observations for that. Um, they'll be looking at pulsars for sure because the pulsar timing, the pulsar search, you know, more sensitivity is better, but, but really you can do it already once you have that timing efficiency. So I think there'll be a lot of pulsar observations. Uh, and then the other thing they'll be wanting to start to do is to build a better model of the sky at those frequencies because it's that sky model that we use to actually calibrate the data. Um, and every time we get a better telescope, we get a better model of the sky. So it's a little bit of a chicken and the egg. So that's the other science case that will be really prominent. So just to clarify, right, the uh, uh, SKA mid is has the two different dish designs because they're part of these and the yep. one as well. That's right. Is there much of a difference between the two? They're slightly different size. Um, at the moment, they have different feeds on them in terms of the, the frequency ranges they look like, but the Meerkat feeds will be replaced to be identical to SKA. So um, for most science, they'll just, it'll all look the same because the, the SKA mid technology is a lot simpler. It's just a single pixel, you know, um, you know, more standard dish type telescope. So I think the only real, um, the, the only real difference they're going to see is it's a slightly different field of view.